Uh, welcome to the first research conversation in our technology and social justice webinar series. I am Laura Haas, Dean of the College of Information and Computer Sciences at UMass Amherst. The College of Information and Computer Sciences engages in research and teaching, united by the concept computing for the common good. This describes the societal impact of our research and education in computer science over more than 50 years and also our aspirations. We welcome the dialogue that has been catalyzed by social protests in this country and worldwide and recognize that technology is central to the issues facing our country. Rapid adoption of new technologies and the pace of innovation amplify both positive and negative impacts of computer science research. As computer scientists, we must grapple with research challenges while critically assessing the potential for misuse, hidden bias, lack of transparency, and unintended consequences of our technical innovations. Our new series, Technology and Social Justice, is designed to engage in this critical assessment. Each webinar will focus on a different technology whose impact on society is extraordinary in both visible and invisible ways. We will explore how computing innovation intersects with vitally important issues such as structural bias, civic participation, economic inequality, and citizen privacy. The focus of today's webinar is in the news daily, debated in town meetings, state legislatures, and in Congress, face recognition and regulation. Just a few years ago, teaching machines to see and think might have sounded like science fiction. In addition to research funded by military and government agencies, though, the field of computer vision is now pursued by large tech companies like Google, Amazon, and Microsoft. Uber and Tesla have hired machine vision researchers for their self-driving car and autonomous vehicle programs. Today, it is being used in a wide variety of settings including law enforcement without regulation and with little training in the technology's abilities and limitations. Our speaker, Professor Eric Learned Miller, is a computer science researcher whose impact on the field of computer vision has been enormous. His award-winning face data set, labeled Faces in the Wild, is one of the most influential face data sets in the world, cited over 4,000 times and used by companies such as Google and Facebook to test their facial recognition accuracy. Professor Learned Miller joined the CICS faculty in 2004 after earning his master's and doctoral degrees in electrical engineering and computer science from MIT. In 2019, he received the PAMI Mark Everingham Award for his work on face recognition benchmarks. He is currently working on an initiative to regulate the use of face recognition technology and to minimize the harm it could cause based on algorithmic bias and other risks. Some of the results of this work can be found in a new white paper, Facial Recognition Technologies in the Wild, A Call for a Federal Office, co-authored by Joy Bulamuni of MIT's Media Lab and founder of the Algorithmic Justice League, and computer scientists, Vicente Ordonez of the University of Virginia and Jamie Morgenstern at the University of Washington. Eric will be speaking for approximately 20 minutes today and then we'll be taking questions. If you have a question, please ask it using the Q&A tool at the bottom of the screen. We'll be using the chat for side discussions but taking all of our questions through the Q&A tool. It is now my great pleasure to, to present a discussion of face recognition and regulation with Professor Eric Learned Miller. Eric. Thanks so much, Laura. Let's see, I'll uh, share my screen here and um, go right into my presentation. So let me know if you can see my presentation. Can you, uh, is anybody on audio? Sorry, yes, Eric, we can okay, see. Okay, great. Okay, 
So welcome everybody. Uh, it's great to have so many different kinds of people here uh, with so many different types of expertise. Um, I, I know there are people uh, with expertise in law, uh, people from industry, from big companies uh, and small companies, uh, technologists, students, and, um, and policymakers. And uh, in addition, I wanna welcome my mom and dad and my in-laws, so, and uh, I think my sister's here as well. So we welcome everybody in this conversation because face recognition affects everybody. And um, you know, whether you're a technology person or somebody who's being recognized or people who are making policy, um, it, it affects you one way or another. And I, you know, we want to hear from everybody about their opinions on this. So let me start with that. On the right, you see the cover of the white paper we just published that Laura was talking about. And the central claim in that paper is that uh, we, we are suggesting that we should be seriously thinking about a new federal office uh, to regulate face recognition because there are um, so many complexities and so many issues uh, that it entails um, and uh, the regulation of it is so complicated that that we don't think it's enough to leave it to industry to self-regulate or to pass sort of piecemeal laws in states and cities across the country but we need a coordinated effort to do this and i welcome uh, opinions from anybody on what they think about that all right, so uh, to set the background a little, I just wanna talk about a few dates that are important to the development of my thinking in face recognition. So in 2003, I started working in face recognition. And, um, and when I started, two of the things that I noticed at the beginning were the standards for measuring performance or measuring accuracy in face recognition, I thought could be improved by new benchmarks that would uh, test the accuracy of algorithms, at least in the, uh, in the research community. There were already some great benchmarks provided by the National Institute of Standards and Technology, but I, I think the research community needed better ones. And also people were focused on studying face recognition in controlled settings, like with passport photos or um, driver's license photos, and not so much in everyday settings. And so uh, to push that along, we published um, this new benchmark, Labeled Face in the Wild, in 2007 to try to help researchers make progress in these areas. Then um, around 2014 and a little bit earlier, um, there was a revolution in neural network technology. Uh, it took a few big leaps forward and that had a huge impact on face recognition technology. It went from being something that worked kind of okay in some situations to really working pretty well in a lot of situations. That didn't, doesn't mean it didn't make any mistakes, but it was working well enough that industry took notice and it caused a second wave of commercial interest, which is continuing today. And there are hundreds of companies involved in trying to do, develop and market face recognition technology. So that's an important change that's happened in the last decade. Not long after this, uh, people started raising concerns about um, face recognition technology. Uh, people like Claire Garvey at Georgetown Law, who's on the call today, I think, and uh, Joy Boilamwini, my co-author on the technical report, have been instrumental in raising concerns about all the things that can go wrong with this technology. And that is also continuing today. And um, because I was involved in building some of the big benchmarks for face recognition and some of the big data sets with which machine learning algorithms are developed using these technologies, I was approached several times by people who said, hey, Eric, you know, LFW, the labeled face in the wild was okay, but, you know, why don't you, you know, make a really great database that solves all these problems we're seeing with, you know, there are not enough women in your database or, you know, we need more diversity and more situations covered and so forth. And I took this idea seriously. I thought, you know, maybe we can solve a lot of these problems by building the right kind of database or the right kind of benchmark. But the more I worked on it, the more it seemed like a futile effort. And ultimately, the conclusion I came to was, we're never gonna make this technology perfect. So rather than 
trying to make it perfect with a perfect database uh, or the perfect training set or perfect benchmark, we need to be able to uh, manage the errors that it does make. And we, we need to think about exactly uh, how we're gonna manage it um, to handle those errors because we're never gonna get rid of all the errors. So um, if, if the ultimate training set or the ultimate benchmark is not the solution, then, um, then what should we do with this technology? And um, you're gonna hear me make a lot of analogies to the Food and Drug Administration today. And so I thought I'd go through a little thought experiment with you for some historical perspective. So I want you to imagine that it's the year 1900, I guess 120 years ago by now, and suppose you have a sick child and you go to the local drugstore to get something for the child. And on the shelves, you'd see things, you know, with labels like this. And you might be wondering which of these things are safe and effective and which are ineffective and even worse, which could be, you know, maybe my child is allergic to some of these or maybe they interact with some of the medications they're already taking. But you wouldn't have good answers to those questions in all likelihood. If you look closely at some of these medicines, they make claims like this one cures headaches, neuralgia, cough, cold, sneezing, hiccups, gout, gonorrhea, diphtheria, mumps, measles, whooping cough, and even tuberculosis. And today we know that that's absurd. Um, and when we go to a drugstore today, we take it for granted that such medicines have been carefully vetted, that they're safe and effective, and um, that they're not going to interact with the, the types of drugs we're already taking and so forth. Of course, it's not perfect, but um, it's good enough so that we have a lot of faith uh, in these systems today. So um, I want to give you a real world example of how the FDA has, has made a huge impact on people's lives. And of course, I'll get back to face recognition, but this is an important analogy. Um, so in the late 1950s, uh, a drug called thalidomide, which many of you have heard about, I'm sure, was marketed in, in 46 countries across the world. And in 1960, a company called Richardson Merrill applied for approval to sell thalidomide in the United States. Now, fortunately, the FDA had just hired Dr. Francis Kelsey, who was assigned to analyze uh, thalidomide for the FDA, uh, and she was, she was, her task was to analyze the, the data uh, supplied by the company that wanted it approved. And she decided that they had not demonstrated through their experiments that the, that the drug was safe and effective, even though it had been already marketed in 46 other different countries. So she demanded that they produce more data to show safety, in particular in pregnant women. This turned out to be stunningly uh, important because in the first few years of the 1960s, more than 10,000 babies were born uh, in other countries with deformities and, and various birth defects from thalidomide. So effectively, she, Dr. Francis Kelsey saved the United States from these massive numbers of uh, birth defects by putting the brakes on, on this drug. And it's important to realize she didn't ban it uh, or anything like that. She simply asked them for more data to convince her that it was safe and effective. And it was a standard that they didn't meet. And fortunately, they didn't meet it because um, because it wasn't true. And so there's some, some important lessons to learn from, uh, I'm just checking my time here, I, from, from the thalidomide case. Uh, one is that expertise is really critical. It's important to have people evaluating technology or new products that really understand what's going on. And Dr. Kelsey had a, a PhD in pharmacology and she also had an MD. And this saved us from thousands of deaths due to uh, thalidomide. Um, another point I want to make is that the drug had appeared to be safe in most people, but it hadn't been analyzed for its effects on pregnancy. So context is critical. And you know, a technology can, can be perfectly benign in one context and, and completely uh, and very dangerous and damaging in another. And it's important to uh, be sensitive to that. And finally, the last point I want to make about the thalidomide case is you think, well, of course, thalidomide has been banned. And 
and actually it was initially banned and that was almost certainly a good thing when when people realized that it was having all these birth defects and so forth uh, it was banned however many years later uh, after special protocols were put in place it's been reapproved for use in the US uh, using protocols that ensure it's not used by pregnant women so despite its dangers we can benefit from it today in some circumstances and that's a really important point because when we get to face recognition there's always going to be a debate uh, about whether we should ban all of it or perhaps try to find cases where it might be useful or beneficial to use it and um, and what do we need to do to draw the line between those cases so now I want to I want to turn from drugs and pharmaceuticals back to um, back to face recognition and a recent example where it went wrong. Um, so this fellow on the right uh, is Robert Williams, and he was misidentified by a face recognition uh, algorithm uh, and matched with. Um, his driver's license photo, which he didn't realize was in a database that the police could use, um, was matched with the picture of somebody robbing a jewelry store, but it wasn't him. Uh, so he was falsely accused of robbing the store and he was arrested in front of his family and, and detained for 30 hours. Um, and when you think about the consequences that something like this this can have of course um he managed to keep his cool uh, as he was being arrested which is you know not to be taken for granted since he was innocent and probably wondered what was going on um so when this happens to you there, there's a clear risk of escalation during an arrest and we all know all the terrible things that can happen uh, in those cases um also he was humiliated and intimidated uh, and his his kids went through trauma um his wife had to call his employer on the monday after he was arrested and uh tell the employer that he couldn't come to work because he was in jail for having robbed a jewelry store but that he didn't do it, of course. Um, and, and then you can imagine that um, many employers would, would, uh, would, would assume the worst in that case, which is, which is uh, unfortunate again. And of course, there's loss of time and income. So these are really serious problems and uh, we wanna try to figure out how we can, can av avoid these things. Um, so, I want to say a little bit more about how this happened. So, um, so what we have here is an investigative lead report from the Detroit Police Department. And, and in the lower left, you can see kind of a, a grainy picture of somebody in a jewelry store. And uh, this was footage that saw a person taking uh, some items from the shop. Um, now you could see more, I, I don't have access to the original picture, so I can't tell you about the quality of the picture, but, but this is a um, obfuscated version of the picture. Now some face recognition software found a match between that picture and the, um, the picture on the right, which is um, Mr. Sorry, I've got a uh, Mr. Uh, Williams driver's license photo. It's not a booking photo, it's a, it's a driver's license photo but this was an incorrect match. And you know, one of the most interesting things about this case is that the argument from many people who sell face recognition software is that, well, of course you shouldn't use it as a certain um, result that can be used to arrest somebody. You only use it as an investigative lead. And if you look, which means you shouldn't use it to arrest somebody until you have a clear additional evidence that gives you probable cause to arrest somebody. For example, like they were seen in the store this, on, on the same day or something like that. Um, and unfortunately in this case, there was no significant additional um, probable cause for arrest and the officers relied only on this report to essentially um, arrest um, this person. So, so um, and I, I just want to highlight here, um, you know, that that the report itself says that the recognition shouldn't be used that way, 
but unfortunately the people were either not trained in how to use it properly or they ignored these, uh, these, um, these rules. So it's sometimes, you, you know, you could attribute this error to an error in technology, but probably it's more reasonable in this case to attribute it to an error in how the technology was used. And, and that's why I say, you know, we need to figure out what we're gonna do with technology when it makes mistakes, not assume that, that it never will make mistakes. So an obvious question uh, that comes out of this is, should we ban all face recognition technology? Um, now, there are many issues with this, including the practical issues. Any, anybody who takes my class at, at UMass, my graduate class in neural networks, can build their own face recognition system. So it's, it's um, and, and there are thousands of people out there already who can do this. So it's, it's hard to put the horses back in the barn uh, but we could certainly outlaw face recognition. Um, and, and maybe we should ban it, uh, at least certain applications of it in the short term. Um, but there are many good applications. Uh, for example, it can be used to automatically uh, diagnose certain medical conditions, can be used to unlock your personal computer devices with minimal risk. Um, and it can be used to help find missing and abused children. It's currently used that way by the FBI and has been responsible for helping to find uh, a large number of uh, missing and abused children and so forth. So, you know, there are uses uh, that, that seem like we don't want to just throw those away if we can help it. Um, and so that raises the follow-up question, can we find a way to allow the reasonable applications while regulating uh, the dangerous ones? And, um, and so um, if we look at complex technologies with large societal impact, there are, many, um, there are many precedents for how to regulate these things. As I said before, pharmaceuticals and medical devices are both regulated by the Food and Drug Administration, and you have something like the aviation industry, which is also extremely complex and is uh, successfully regulated by the FAA. But we have uh, other technologies like face recognition and AI, these recently emerging technologies that are more or less unregulated. There, there are some regulations, for example, uh, many uh, cities have banned uh, the municipal use of face recognition, and uh, Washington State just passed a a, uh, a very nice uh, a law regulating face recognition in certain ways. But overall, there's no comprehensive federal uh, legislation so far, and um, and we believe that the problem is complex enough that that it deserves its uh, its own uh, federal office. So uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail now, and you can read our whole 55-page uh, white paper if you like. Um, but uh, what we try to do in that paper is borrow ideas from the FDA in how they regulate things um, and use that as a template for how to start thinking about uh, regulating face recognition technology. So like one of the key ideas is to carefully define, uh, you know, what software is used for defining its intended use, like who will it be used on, who will it be used by, where will it be used, what are the necessary conditions for proper use. For example, um, if you have a grainy photo, maybe you shouldn't put it into a face recognition system because the error rates will be too high for that photo. And have people been properly trained in its instruction? Is the labeling prominent, clear, and easy to understand? So these are core concepts that the FDA uses to um, regulate uh, both pharmaceuticals and medical devices. Uh, they also have concepts like counterindications, which is where a product shouldn't be used. This is particularly important for the pharmaceutical industry where we say, yeah, you shouldn't take this drug if you're pregnant, uh, if you have heart problems, if you're a child under 12 years old, for example. So I'll, uh, I won't go into more detail there now because it's a big complicated topic, but uh, I do want to say that we're trying to, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. And uh, you know, there are sophisticated regulatory structures out there in places like the FDA 
and um, we can borrow from those. And uh, we think databases are not enough. But in other words, better databases with more diversity and more cases, that's not gonna solve the problem by itself. Self-regulation by industry is not enough and ethical guidance is not enough. Um, and we argue for an independent government organization with dedicated expertise and the authority to keep products from emerging until they've demonstrated safety and efficacy. So I will stop talking there and I look forward to uh, hearing from you all about uh, your questions. Thank you so much, Eric. Uh, once again, as a reminder to people, we're using the Q&A tool to ask questions. So if you would like to ask a question, um, please just enter your question in the Q&A tool and I will read them out for Eric to uh, answer for us. Um, so our first question, Eric, comes from Harpreet Sani. Uh, hi, Harpreet, um, who asks, what about other biometric technologies? Are they also used as investigative tools and not for conclusive evidence? Do they have much better performance than face recognition? Are any of those regulated? Um, let's see. Yes, I'm, my, my mic's still on, right? Hi, Harpreet. Nice to have you here. Um, so there's a huge number of biometric technologies. Uh, you know, some of the, the more well-known ones are DNA and fingerprinting. So uh, DNA is certainly uh, less prone to errors, but um, I don't know a lot about DNA, uh, about exactly what's allowed uh, in terms of DNA in court, but I, but I do know that when DNA first started being used in courts, um, there were bumps in the road, uh, you know, probably places where it was used inappropriately or where, um, you know, there were issues like contamination, but, you know, DNA samples can be contaminated, which can, can cause problems. And, and so I think with all of these technologies, um, there, there's, uh, there's a development uh, as they go. Um, one of the special things, this is not exactly related to your question, but one of the special things about face recognition as a biometric and, and makes people more worried about it than many other things is that unlike something like fingerprinting or iris scanning, you can, uh, you can acquire somebody's face from a distance. So I can look at you with a surveillance camera across the street, track you and, and keep track of you and build a portfolio of where you've been and so forth uh, without, ever, with you out, without you ever knowing about it. Um, and I certainly can't do that um, with things like iris scans because you need the cooperation of the person to get the identity. So, that's something that raises the stakes quite a bit. All right, let's go on. For okay, another. we have a, uh, a question from Thomas Snellum, who asks, what about tools like Clearview AI? Hasn't the horse really left the barn? Right, so yeah, so Clearview is in the news a lot, and it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's very powerful technology, and it's, um, being used by uh, law enforcement a lot, but it's also leaked out and being used by private citizens in some cases where it's not appropriate. Uh, um, well, the, the horse is out of the barn, but we can still pass laws that make it illegal. So, um, you know, I, I, I think that should be pulled back. Um, I, I mean, you know, people marketed dangerous drugs before the FDA and after the FDA was put into place, <laughs> people had to start stop marketing those drugs. So nothing says that we can't outlaw uh, software that hasn't been properly vetted. Thank you. Marty Allen would like to know, um, we also regulate technologies involving weapons systems, preventing their sharing with certain countries and their governments. Do we need to extend similar controls to face recognition, given that it is being exploited by non-US governments that we can't directly regulate? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm no international technology transfer expert, that's for sure. But I will say that most of the methods that are used in products today are already in the public domain. Uh, you know, they're published in papers that anybody can get access to. 
And so unlike advanced, some advanced military technologies, uh, which are carefully controlled, it's out there already. I mean, you know, like I said, anybody who takes my class at UMass can build a, a, a passable face recognition system. Um, and so, um, and there's already very advanced technology in many, many countries, including, you know, China and, and other places. So that, that horse is out of the barn and I don't think it's coming back in. Thank you. Um, your next question comes from Isla Thorntona. It's a great question. In terms of this new executive organization you mentioned, what sense of expertise are you thinking would prove most effective to be included in that body? But most importantly, how will that also ensure that equity is used as a lens yeah. for enforcement? Yeah, another great question. <laughs> so uh, I think there's there are different dimensions in which you need expertise. Um, the, the application dimension is one. So, you know, you definitely would want somebody with expertise in law enforcement, for example. And that could be somebody, you know, who's been a detective or a forensic uh, expert or somebody like that, that also has technology expertise. But you also want people from advocacy organizations like, you know, the ACLU or public defenders, uh, people who've been on the other side seeing what happens to people uh, who are falsely accused so that they can uh, make sure that those issues are considered and, and that we can prevent things as much as possible. So, um, you know, at least the applications domain and, and the, you know, the socio, um, social legal domains are, are things that you would want to incorporate. Um, Kyle Vetter asks, the FAA is closer than the proposed, to, the pro, to the proposed agency than FDA due to the need to regulate very complex technology. And he points out that the FAA has had to um, resign a, a significant amount of oversight to the aircraft manufacturers themselves, leading to disasters like the 737 MAX. So how will the proposed agency solve this problem? Um, well, I, I mean, certainly modern airlines are incredibly complex, but if you look at the medical device industry, you have things like automatic radiation delivery devices, which are, I would argue, uh, on par of complexity with, with things in the aviation industry. So, so medical devices are also incredibly complicated. Um, the the way the FDA works with drugs and medical devices, and I went through this because I, I co-founded a medical device co company back in the 90s, um, you make a case uh, that, that um, your product is safe and effective and you have expertise at the, uh, at the regulatory agency that evaluates whether you made that case successfully or not. Now, it's true that the FAA is struggling with that right now. They, they, they did, you know, the pendulum swung too far back towards allowing the companies to define their own procedures and, and the FAA not digging into that enough. I, I'm not an expert about that and I would love to hear somebody of the FAA talk about it. But that's always a back and forth that occurs. And, and when there is a problem, um, I think the pendulum tends to swing back the other way. So uh, it's a great point and there's no magic solution to that. You just have to keep working for the right balance. But the model, just to be clear, is that industry presents a case um, in, the, in the medical device industry, it's called a 510K pre-market notification. You, the industry authors that for a particular product and, and you can think of it like a court case. They're making a case that their device is safe and effective before it can be marketed. And then it's judged by somebody at the FDA. Um, so yeah, that, that's a cooperative process and um, it's never perfect, but it's a lot better than not having it. Great. Um, here's a here's a hard one. How do you see the future of facial recognition evolving? This comes from Sai Samir Venom. Do you see it becoming ubiquitous um, as authoritarian governments realize its power for surveillance in more and more ways? 
Well, it's certainly, um, you know, it's certainly heavily used in China right now. And um, so like any other technology that's used by another government, that's going to be something that, um, you know, the U.S. has to decide how they're going to use it and then how they want to exert pressure on other governments to, to keep it from being used that way or, or not. Uh, so that, you know, that's really a diplomacy issue. Uh, I'd like to see that doesn't happen in the US. Um, it, it could happen anywhere, but, but it's up to us to, to set the policy to, to keep that from happening. Because uh, it's certainly gone very far in that direction in some countries. Okay. Um, Karen Meacham has a policy question for you. She'd like to understand where facial recognition currently falls as far as federal oversight. Is there any agency that has jurisdiction and or are there members of Congress showing any leadership on this? That's a great question. And honestly, there are probably people on this call who know a lot more about it than I do, but it's not, um, I have heard that there are sub offices in many different parts of the government that are all analyzing this separately. And I, I think that's not a good situation. I mean, imagine that, you know, the uh, Department of Homeland Security and the military and three other departments all had their own office to assess the effect, efficacy of, of drugs. I mean, that would be absurd. But that's kind of, I think, what's emerging. Um, not because a decision was made to do that, but just because that's how it's evolving. But th the truth is, I don't know as much about that as I would like. And, I, and what I'd like to see is a central point of decision making and understanding for the technology. Great. Uh, our next question comes from Jackson Coat with the digital news outlet Mass Live. What about tech companies that are aggressively marketing these inaccurate softwares to local police departments, would they be monitored by the federal agency you've proposed? Yeah, so the way it would work it, it is just the way the FDA works. So if let's say you're a medical device company and you want to make a new um, implantable pacemaker, um, then what you do is um, you show the design of the pacemaker to the FDA, the design, the tests, the engineering practices, the quality control procedure results. You, you submit a thousand pages of, of stuff to them that says, look, we really know what we're doing. We've developed 275 other medical products. We've developed heart technology before. These are the people that are working on it and their background. And you tell them everything that um, you think is relevant to arguing that your device is safe and effective. And also you have clinical trials in new types of uh, devices where you get something called an investigational device exemption so that you can try your products on volunteers and things like that. And then you present that evidence. So I would like to see all those same kinds of ideas implemented so that um, a company that wants to get into the business has to provide this level of support. But let me say one other thing, which is this makes a lot of small companies nervous, right? Because if there's a huge bar to getting, getting your product out there, then that can shut out innovation and, and make a huge barrier to entry. But there's a, there's a saving grace, which is that one of the things we want to do is establish application risk levels. So an application that's used to sort photos on your personal computer has less risk associated with making errors than say uh, something that is um, being used to arrest people by the police, right? So if you can establish, if you declare that your application is for only for use say on a personal computer by a private citizen, then the risk level is much lower and your, um, and your proof, your, the proof of efficacy is much less stringent. And so that would allow companies, small companies without huge resources to develop the technology, get products into the game. And then as they grow, they have more resources to put into 
uh, higher level risk uh, applications that require much more vetting study and investigational device uh, studies and so forth. So it's sort of a path that allows, you know, lots of different kinds of companies to get involved. Excellent. Um, Cristobal Pedregal Martin asks a, a tough one. As with uh, familial DNA, where any blood relative may enable my own tracking without my awareness, let alone consent, are there any similar transitive closure risks with face recognition? For example, identifying people in groups or using close relative spaces to break a tie on a candidate face? Absolutely. So, uh, and, and now, of course, I don't have access to all the technology being used by the current Chinese government. However, they are doing an enormous, I, I, if you believe the reports that are, that are written in, in the newspapers, they are using many, many different technologies to track people um, so that they can um, combine these technologies. So for example, if you're looking at somebody from a distance uh, going out of a cafe and you can only see the back of their head, but you can see the person next to them and you have a database that says those two people have been associating with each other for a long time, you can likely confirm the identity of the person even if you can only see the back of their head. So this is a, a ubiquitous uh, process in tracking people where Face recognition is just one tool out of, out of a large set of tools that you can use to track and surveil people. So absolutely, this, this happens all the time. And, and, many, and many companies in the US also do this. Um, so for example, um, if I suppose, um, um, you, you know, when I'm marketing to somebody, if, if if their best friend does a search for um, a particular product, I might send an ad for that product to the other friend uh, because I know that they're likely to be talking about it. So when you get these creepy ads um, uh, in certain social media things where you, you don't understand how they knew you were looking for a new pair of shoes, um, they may have um, leveraged your, your, your connections with other people. Scary. Um, <laughs> while we're on the scary side, um, I, I, one question from Risha Maheshwari asks, how do law enforcement justify the use of face recognition technology today? Shouldn't it be naturally unlawful if we are being tracked, being watched, or with, um, without our yeah. consent? Yeah. So, um, well, it, it, th this is a complicated, it's a great question. It's a complicated topic. You know, one of the things I could say is that um, I was involved in a face recognition program run by one of the government agencies a few years ago. And some of the people using the software were the FBI to identify uh, child abuse victims and, and, and people trafficking in, 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 child in child abuse and child pornography. And they were using, they were tracking people and recognizing people uh, using face recognition technology to try to find children who'd been abducted and put in sex trafficking rings, you know? So you can shut down all face recognition technology if you want, but that's gonna be one of the casualties of it is, is these uses in law enforcement. And, and if you believe the people I've talked to at the FBI, it is, um, really helping substantially with those kinds of cases. So that could, you know, be something that gets you starting to use this stuff. And then once these tools are around, if their use isn't carefully dictated um, by the manufacturer, which it is not today, then people can start to say, well, we've got this software, why don't we try it for this other thing? And, and why, why don't we do, you know, and, and people start to use it in ways that were not originally intended. So that's one reason that we really believe that specifying the appropriate use of a, of a software package is critical before you allow it to be sold and deployed. You've got to put limits on it from the beginning and say, this software will never be used 
for anything other than this. And if you decide, hey, we want to go back and use it for a new thing, this is exactly what happens in the pharmaceutical industry when somebody says, you know, I'd really, uh, ibuprofen um, is only used as an analgesic normally, but I'd, I'd like to use it to treat diabetes. Then you have to, then that's called an off-label use and you have to go back and, uh, and, and try to get it approved for off-label usage. Um, and that's a complicated discussion on pharmaceuticals, but the idea is if you're going to use it for something new and different, then, then it needs to be reevaluated for that new purpose. Right. Did I answer the question? Kind of? Kind of. I think so. We'll, kind give, of. It, we'll, get, we'll give you a pass. Okay. Okay. Um, here's, a, here's an interesting one from Chris Burt. He says, we've all heard a lot about another kind of uh, regulation recently, privacy regulation, such as the European Union's GDPR style uh, data regulation. And so he's wondering whether that kind of regulation can address these same concerns for a wider range of technologies. Yeah, so, um, I mean, you sort of explained this, Laura, but the GDPR is the General Data Protection Regulations, I think, in Europe, which, which put pretty strong controls on the use of data by people, by companies. So, so that addresses many issues. It, it can address issues of surveillance um, and, and other things. But it's just one of the issues, right? It doesn't really um, address uh, things like uh, the police using it or... Um, so, I, so I would say it's an, an important component of, of the solution, but not, but not the whole solution. It's really focused on privacy and data rights and not uh, all the things that can happen when face recognition makes an error. Um, Renu uh, Chipokari asks, so what do you envision the approval process to be for this new federal organization beyond the testing, reviewing, training data, et cetera? Yeah, yep. Well, if so, you know, um, this is a very, very long discussion. And if you read our technical report and you make it to the end, I congratulate you because it's, it's a, it's um, do so. Basically, the idea. If you want to learn more about this, just Google for how do you get a medical device approved by the FDA, and you'll see that you have to talk about many, many different aspects, like not just what were your final testing scores, but what were your software uh, quality assurance procedures. How did you design uh, test cases? for the software how you know did you have code reviews did you um you know does the database that you use to train it match the database where you plan to deploy uh this software and how are you going to keep people from deploying it in a new place where the people the make the, the demographic makeup of the people doesn't match the people that it was originally tested on so um of course, one solution to that would be to say, we're only going to allow this to be used in a very particular place or a very particular setting. So it's, it's a complex interaction between deciding the precise specification of where and how and who it can be used by with all the things you did in developing it and, um, and testing it and ensuring quality control um, another big thing for the FDA is labeling. So that's one of seven big categories they have. And, and labeling to the FDA means everything from the things you see on your pill bottles to inst an instruction manual for a radiation therapy delivery device. So I wrote an instruction manual for our image guided neurosurgery product, and I had to write in many, many places that if you make an error in this part of the procedure, you can kill the patient. It's not easy to write that in the manual, um, but the fact that I wrote it means that doctors will be, you know, they'll be warned that if they screw up using our product, then they can kill somebody. And, and those, the FDA insists on that kind of honest labeling. 
It's the kind of see, thing you see on a drug ad on TV. You know, side effects may include, you know, death. <laughs> and it's, um, it's obviously a serious issue. So it's a very, very complicated topic and a lot's been written on it. And if you want to get a sense of where I'm headed, just read about how you get a, a device approved by the FDA. Terrific. That'll keep you busy, Rana. Um, so uh, our next question comes from William Wanamaker. Is there a threshold value that you would consider to be a confident match with face ah, recognition? This is would a good you, one. Would you recommend a standard value for making an accusation if this were to go to a federal office? Yeah, the value is three. No, I'm just kidding. It's, uh, <laughs> there is a uh, no, and there, and there are many, many reasons. It, it, it's a great question, you know, be, and just for those who may not understand the exact nature of the question, many face recognition um, programs or pieces of software come with some sort of a confidence assessment, like we believe that this is 95% likely to be correct. Now, unfortunately, so, so one question you might ask is, when the software says that the, it believes they're 95 percent accurate are their error rates higher than five percent because if they are then that confidence rate was was not good it, it, it was it was meaningless effectively um and so so the first thing you have to do is establish that the confidence rating actually makes sense and what you often find is that it makes sense in one setting, like for passport photos, but when you move to uh, photos in dim lighting or something like that, the confidence level is completely wrong. So their 99% confidence level will have 20% errors. So the short version is really the confidence levels are often nearly meaningless. Um, now, it's an active research issue to try to make better confidence intervals or confidence assessments of software, but it's by no means a solved problem. So for the moment, I think you have to say uh, it's at best a weak guide for how to use the software at any level. Great. Um... So I'm going to, we, we have a flood of questions here. I'd like to highlight one from your co-author, uh, Joy Belong. Bel well, well, I'm <laughs> Sorry, Joy, I do know how to say it, um, in the In the absence of this FDA-styled federal office, what approach do you recommend for addressing harms and abuse from a whole range of facial recognition technologies? What is your view on a federal moratorium and the absence of red lines and guidelines? Um, well, as I said, uh, hi, Joy. <laughs> and uh, as I said uh, during my presentation, I think, or maybe I just implied it, um, I think uh, a temporary ban of certain types of technologies for it um, is, uh, a pretty reasonable option right now. I, um, you know, I, it's a bit of a nuanced question, but to, to give a specific example, so there was a, a CEO of a Chilean company, I've forgotten the name of the company, who proposed in Forbes the other day that we ban um, face recognition that does not include the consent of the person. So something like unlocking your phone with your own face, it implicitly uses your own consent. Uh, most of the time, although not all the time. Um, and so if you took a broad category of things like face recognition technologies that did not include people's consent, uh, personally, I would be fine with putting a temporary ban on that until we can uh, come up with a more nuanced view uh, about how to separate these technologies. Um, now note that such a ban would eliminate things that most people consider benign, like sorting the personal photos on your personal computer. So I'd like to be able to, you know, move as quickly as we can towards allowing the low risk applications and, uh, and, and holding off on the high risk applications 
uh, which means a I would support a temporary ban um, on, on applications deemed to be high risk. Um, yeah. So while we're on the topic of um, risk of applications, Ryan Connell asks, with a vast diversity of beliefs in the United States, political, religious, etc., how do we? How would you propose picking and choosing the use cases for facial recognition that are considered harmful or helpful? Is the, is it that clear cut? Uh, let's see. Um, well, you know. Uh, the process that I believe in is, again, starting with the intended use of software. And once you've written down the intended use, you know, this is intended to make matches against a felony database, for example, for the pur purposes of arresting people. Then you have a procedure that you go through a risk analysis where you sit down with 10 people from all different uh, walks of life and, and um, including legal people and uh, people, you know, people like the ACLU and stuff like this. And you say, what are all the terrible things that could happen with this? And if you don't have a way to mitigate or control for all those risks, irrespective of who they are, who they affect, then it's probably not time to market that software yet. Um, now, of course, there's some judgment involved in that, but, um, uh, again, I've lost track of whether I answered the question exactly or not, but yeah, um, I think it's an interesting question, but I, I think um, many of the applications can easily be put in a high risk category or a low risk category by people who've really been involved in, in these kinds of debates for a long time. Um, of course, who should that be? Uh, well, you need to, uh, you know, appoint experts that, that you think can do it. And ultimately, there has to be some degree of trust for those experts. Great. Um, as with, um, I, have a, I have a very thought-provoking uh, question here from Jocelyn Simmer. Just, uh, so we're at five o'clock. So yeah. uh, let, shall, we, shall we just decide on a couple more or maybe? Yeah, I, I was gonna let us have maybe two more of these okay. questions. We have a wonderful list here and I really apologize to all the people that we are not able to, to, to get answers in. But I really like this um, question from, from Jocelyn Simmer. Um, she's asking, she makes the point that image and video doctoring such as deep fakes is evolving very rapidly. Um, and she's wondering if we should anticipate a point in the future where we can no longer trust um, yeah. facial recognition matches, for example, in court. Right. So this is a great example of the kind of risk that you need to assess when you're looking at a product. So if somebody's going to be used, if a picture is going to be used to put somebody in jail, then you need to understand the provenance of that picture, right? And and. And if the answer is we can't ensure the provenance of that picture, then, then, then the regulatory agencies should say, then you can't use it to put somebody in jail, right? So if something like deep fakes prevents us from being able to tell when something has been faked, then we better get that product off the market. Um, I, you know, there's nothing in my belief system that says, we've got to be able to market things no matter what, we just make them as safe as possible. No, that's, that's the wrong idea to me. The idea is we want to make it safe and effective and trustworthy. And if we can't figure out how to do that in a highly risky situation, then we shouldn't allow it to be marketed. And, and again, I'll, I'll draw one more analogy with the FDA. If a company comes and says, we've got a great drug that cures cancer, but it kills half the people who take it from side effects, it's not going to be marketed. You know, it, you have to go back to the drawing board and try to improve it. Uh, the FDA does not approve many of the things that are submitted to it because the case is simply not made to them. All right. All right. As a last question, probably unanswerable, but I'll let you do your, your darndest. Um, this one from Abhirup Mukherjee might be a, a suitable closing. He asks, what can we as individuals do to ensure that this new push for regulation on facial recognition actually leads to some tangible change 
given that the push to pay more attention to the ethics surrounding this technology and other ML technologies has been around for more than a couple of years now. And yet, here yeah. we are. Well, one, you know, I felt like one of the things that's happened to me is I worked with people like Joy and Vicente on <clears throat> writing about this topic is that I've, I've learned a lot more um, anecdotes about real world cases, you know, people who are kept out of their own apartment building by a face recognition system, somebody was falsely arrested, somebody, um, and the real world consequences of those things. Uh, somebody who didn't get a job because um, their face was analyzed automatically by software and the person had, you know, couldn't move the left side of their face since birth, but the software thought they were sleepy and so it said they were a bad candidate. You know, so when you learn these, uh, these true stories and you understand the, the, the negative consequences of these things, I think it's important to share them with uh, with other people, especially other technology people, because technology people tend to be overconfident and not spend that much time thinking about the flaws of their products. And, and when you learn these, you know, true stories of the negative things that can happen to people, I think it's very compelling. And, and I think it changes the way a lot of people think. So I would encourage you to, you know, read about these cases and, and learn about them and share them with the people that you know, because I think ultimately we all want, you know, safe and effective stuff out there. Um, and there are a lot of useful applications if, if we can get a handle on this stuff. Great. Thank you, Eric. On behalf of the community, I would like to thank you very much for this really fascinating um, presentation and the discussion. I'd like to thank the audience for all the questions that were submitted. I didn't give him half the, the really thought provoking ones. I apologize. Um, but we, we got through 19 questions. Um, so that was pretty awesome. Thank you very much, Eric. And we, uh, we, well, we really happy that, that uh, all of you could join us today. Stay tuned for our next um, installment of okay. this. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Yeah, they were great questions. I, I enjoyed it. And uh, please uh, get in touch uh, off, uh, offline if you'd like to continue the discussion. Okay? All right, bye-bye. Okay.